LinkedIn is the critical marketing platform. The demeanor on film in the digital shot is so much more powerful. They weren't round. They didn't fit around the cuticles. So back then I would say, I'm going to invent something. I'm Richard Gerhart. And I'm Elizabeth Gerhart. You just heard some snippets from our show. We had amazing people on. Listen for the rest of it. Want to protect your business? The time is near. You've given it heart. Now, get it in gear. It's Passage to Profit with Richard and Elizabeth Gearhart. I'm Richard Gearhart, founder of Gearhart Law, a full-service intellectual property law firm specializing in patents, trademarks, and copyrights. And I'm Elizabeth Gearhart, not an attorney, but I work at Gearhart Law doing the marketing, and I have my own startups. Welcome to Passage to Profit, everyone, the road to entrepreneurship, where we talk with startups, small businesses, and discuss the intellectual property that helps them flourish. We have an amazing guest, Julie Livingston. She's a public relations expert and a LinkedIn marketing expert. So we're going to learn a lot of hot tips and tricks from her that are going to make us famous on LinkedIn, we hope. And then we have one of those rare breed, a serial entrepreneur, serial podcaster. She has her toes dipped in a lot of different things. I'm really fascinated to hear what she has to say. Lee Wahara lives in New York, and she came to us last minute, thank goodness, but she is a great catch for the show. And after her, we have return guests coming, Barbara and Danielle Gomes. I don't know if you remember them, but they make Cuticle Be Gone if you have fingernails. You need Anybody product. have fingernails? <laughs> you need this product, so stay tuned. That's great. But before we get to our distinguished guests, it's time for IP in the news. And so what are we talking about today? Well, Ford has come up with an ingenious invention and filed a patent application on it. And I really hope that they can make this work. It's a little bit strange. It's a bumper that is like your car airbag. So it inflates if you hit someone or something. And I guess it's designed to protect them in case of impact. So the way it looks in the patent application is your car is driving along with its bumper normal. You hit somebody and this airbag flies out of your bumper, inflates, and the person doesn't get hurt. And then another one goes down lower so they don't get sucked under the car either. Right. It looks like your car has like two really big lips on it when these things <laughs> yeah, inflate. It look like <laughs> <lips>. and- <laughs> you're not getting hit, you're getting a big kiss. And, <laughs> so. and, I, and I assume it could be used anywhere on the car. They showed in the initial figures that it was in the front. I really think, though, that putting them on the back bumper makes a lot of sense because lots of times people are backing out of their driveway and. There's that kid on the bicycle or not paying attention, and you know you're not going too fast, right? And so if you hit them, maybe it'll prevent some accidents that way. I don't know. Now it's time for Richard's Roundtable, and I'm going to ask our phenomenal guests what they think about this situation. Julie Livingston, what do you think about this crazy idea from Ford? Well, it sounds interesting, but it also sounds very complicated. And so I'm wondering if it will be sort of easily understandable by consumers. We were all kind of skeptical when we heard about inflatable car bags on the driver's side. And then they added them for the rear passengers, and now they're on the side, and who knows, maybe they're coming out of the and ceiling that's next. that's true, but I, I guess know. over time it's been engineered and re-engineered so that they work. This being on the outside of the car, I, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I guess we'll have to see. Yeah. I mean, um, maybe if you just tap somebody else's bumper, do they go off? And then, then what happens? You know, Who knows? Yeah, it's a not like this. they can tuck in, unless they have a place to tuck them back in. I'm not sure <laughs> how that would actually function. Kenya, what do you think? I have the same sentiments. It's like, how do you know if you're hitting a person or you're hitting another car? Like, what's the level of impact that makes the sensor That's a great question. Go off. I, I guess we'll have to wait and see. Barbara? I'm all for safety. So if this is the start... For something to come about, maybe there's a lot of questions, but hopefully it will lead to a safer car. You can't disagree with that. Even if it does look a little funny, like your car has lips, if it saves a life or two, it's probably worth it, right? So how can you disagree with that? Lee, what do you think? A couple of things. One, are the bumpers going to match the color of my car? <laughs> and, then, and then what happens if the bumper gets a flat? Like, is there a patch kit that comes with it? I've often wondered, you know, when airbags. Like, and then what happens, what happens then? <laughs> right. These are really important questions. We wouldn't want to be out there with uncolor-coordinated 
bumpers. So, yeah, yeah we have to definitely uh, query forward on that. So that's a really good point. But we need to get on to our guest. Julie Livingston is a public relations expert and a LinkedIn marketing expert. So welcome to the show, Julie. It's great to be here. Tell us a little bit about what's been going on with LinkedIn. Well, LinkedIn is the critical marketing platform for any entrepreneur today and any business today. There are 900 million users on the platform, and it's being used in 200 countries. So the scope and amplification that you could get on LinkedIn is just incredible. And they're always introducing new features, Richard. But I would say that the most important one that's happening right now is artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. And they are uh, really getting into the AI game. So right now, they have a few different ways that they're using AI. One is collaborative articles, which are really cool. So they create an article, or AI creates an article on a particular topic for a particular industry, let's say. And then you will get a prompt. So if you do IP law and the AI picks that up, they will send you articles, AI-generated articles, to comment on. And that's mm. one great way to start showing your expertise on the platform. After you comment, I think it is three times on different collaborative articles, you get a special badge on your profile, which is oh, you know, you're kind a of prestigious. Yay. That's right. That's <laughs> right. But they're experimenting with all kinds of um, other uses of AI as well in terms of correcting your spelling, phrasing, things like that. You'll start to see now when you're writing a post. It will even ask you if you want the platform to help you write a post, which I'm not too thrilled about that because I think when you're on LinkedIn and if you want to successfully stand out, you really want the language to be in your voice. So really, AI is a great tool, but it can never replace how you speak and how you talk. I, we've talked about AI here on the show a couple of times, and the funny thing that we're hearing is that artificial intelligence is now getting better at talking in your particular voice. If you do enough AI types of projects, it'll mimic how you sound and the cadence and the writing and everything like that. So it's, I think it's going to be very hard for people in the future to really distinguish between AI-generated content and their own content. I'm hoping that maybe a trend will develop where people will say, hey, I wrote this myself without the aid of AI. It's just so people know because – you don't know if you're reading something, if it came from a person well, or a computer. You can tell a little bit. There are certain subtleties where you could kind of tell that it doesn't sound authentic necessarily. I think that it does come across. And, and I use a chat GPT, for example, very often to do my research and to help me get past writer's block because I'm composing. I'm a ghostwriter and a content strategist on LinkedIn for, for executives. So, you know, sometimes you get a little tongue-tied and you need a little help. You need some prompting. I do use ChatGPT for that, for getting something, an idea started. But then I need to really sculpt it and shape it so that it sounds like the person I'm ghostwriting for. Well, I have to agree with you, Julie. You know, I wrote a blog post just yesterday, actually, for the law firm, and Richard looked at it and added some things. But what we actually put in the blog post was things that we – personally experienced with law firm clients, clients calling up and asking questions. And that's something that you can't get from AI or chat GPT. But I do think it's a good starting point, especially if you are stumped. I think it has to be a mix, but I think to really position yourself as an expert, and that's really what LinkedIn is all about, right? Positioning yourself as an expert. It has to come from you authentically, right? It does. And you know, you bring up a really great point, Elizabeth, in that Telling stories on LinkedIn, which would happen in your LinkedIn profile, and then in the posting and the content that you develop are so powerful. And I have found that the executives that I do content strategy and ghostwriting for, those are their most successful posts. They get the most traction when they're sharing real stories about what happens to them in the field, and they're showing their vulnerability, too, when they're being really authentic and honest, maybe it's an error that they made or a challenge that they came up against. Then they tell a story about that challenge and how they resolved it. 
People love that. It's a wonderful engagement tool. It elicits a lot of commentary. And I find that not only commentary, but you get a lot of reposts. And people even share photos of themselves in similar situations. So storytelling is paramount. That's really great. I want to switch focus a little bit now and find out what does it really take to stand above the crowd on LinkedIn. There's zillions of people out there, lots of posts. You want to be recognized and acknowledged for the individual that you are. And so how can you do that on LinkedIn? That's a great question, Richard. And I'm going to say it's an ongoing process. But the first thing you need to do is develop a compelling profile that really in an instant, and I mean an instant like under five seconds, People can look at your profile and really the upper half of the profile, what I call above the fold. Is the profile that first picture that people see? Well, the profile is really that whole, it's sort of in three sections, I'll say. So the top of the profile, that top third where your headshot is and where your headline is, is just the most critical. It's like a road sign. It's like a billboard for you. One of my best tips is not only to get a professional headshot because it is worth the money, and it doesn't have to be a big Hollywood production, but have a great headshot where you're making eye contact, where you look kind of happy. I like when people wear a little color around their face. I think it makes them pop. But one of the things that almost every executive I work with doesn't do is use the background, the background header area. And that is prime real estate to tell your story. Going back to what you said, Elizabeth. So use that background to have another photo of you, but not a headshot, something of you in action. Like Richard, for you, maybe it's you at the microphone here in the studio or giving a presentation at a conference that really shows your authority, that you are a thought leader in your industry. So looking at LinkedIn profiles, can you think of some people that you really like their profile page, where they really stand out? Who would you recommend as models for that? Well, one of the most followed people on LinkedIn is Ariana Huffington. I think she's the third most followed person on LinkedIn, and her content is incredible, and her profile is also very, very strong. She uses the background behind the uh, headshot to tell her story effectively with her the branding of her company. And by the way, Canva has great templates that you could use to update the LinkedIn background header. I Very love easy. Canva. Elizabeth's a Canva addict. Every time <laughs> I, I come, and whenever I come home, she's on, what are you doing? I'm I on Canva. You know? I get it. It just <laughs> enlivens your whole presentation right. and gives you so many great tools, to, again, to tell your story in pictures and infographics and word cards are a very powerful kind of LinkedIn post. These are just words, but they look, you know, more than words, right? There are some uh, nice colors and shapes and, and images that you can use, but those are, for my clients, very powerful posts that get a lot of traction. Kenya. Curious about the other social media platforms that are out there, because I know what the function of LinkedIn is, right? What would you say are some of the differences in comparison to, like, how to use Instagram, how to use Twitter, And is there a one-size-fits-all to how you should be using LinkedIn versus how you use your other social media platforms? Absolutely. Uh, So LinkedIn is a business networking platform, and you need to take it a little more seriously in certain ways. You know, if I was thinking of Instagram for a minute or Facebook, you would not necessarily post the same content on LinkedIn that you would on those platforms. And you might not even want to use those platforms to tell your story based on on the industry that you're in and the kind of service or product that you're offering. It may not be appropriate. For example, for my public relations and LinkedIn consulting business, I only use LinkedIn and Facebook, which is negligible in terms of traffic for me. It's really LinkedIn. Hmm. But if I were a consumer product company, I know we're going to be talking about Cuticle Be Gone in a minute. I think that you could use the graphic capabilities of an Instagram of X, certainly YouTube and Facebook for sure. And that LinkedIn would be a great place for the chief executive officer and marketing director of Cuticle Be Gone to have a a major presence because they want to attract business leaders, retailers to buy their product, uh, maybe vendors and suppliers. 
uh, but the language and the content will be very different than what they would have on those other graphical platforms. You can be on different platforms for different purposes. So if you are a consumer products company, but you want to say, hey, we are seriously managed here. We're professionals and we know what we're doing. Then you have the LinkedIn profile. But then on the other hand, if it's all goofy and fun, you can be on Facebook or Instagram and reach the consumer audience that way. Absolutely. I mean, you may decide when you're doing your marketing planning, marketing communications planning, you may decide that, well, LinkedIn should be your thought leadership platform, right? And your leaders, the people who are the kind of the face of your brand or company, should have a presence there. And they should promote who they are, how they think, why they think their company is the best in their industry sector, and also how socially responsible they are, et cetera. But those other platforms are the ones where you could showcase a product or a service in action. I don't underestimate the value of YouTube as well in promoting thought leadership because that really shows leaders in action, how they speak, how they gesticulate, how they talk, how they engage with other people, what they think about. YouTube is very, very important, as is LinkedIn Live or LinkedIn Audio, which is their podcasting platform. I use LinkedIn Live myself. What about people who are a little more reserved and they feel a little less comfortable about putting their thoughts and ideas and themselves out there. What kind of advice do you have for them? Well, LinkedIn is for every business leader. I do believe that. But I think you have to be real and you have to be authentic and present yourself as who you are. I think it is critical to put yourself on the platform, tell your story as vividly as you can, and then you can use photos you can use content development to share your thought leadership. And that can be serious. And it should be anyway. It, anybody's content on LinkedIn should be pretty serious. It's, it's a business networking platform. But there's no reason why a more introverted individual cannot shine on LinkedIn. And that's one of the nice things about LinkedIn. It doesn't necessarily have to be by video or podcast. You can take some time and think about what you're going to say and how you present yourself. You can even ask other people before you post. What do you think about this? I have one client now who's an entrepreneur. She runs a, a women's leadership organization. She's not so much into seeing herself, you know, in photos and video and so on. So a lot of her content is photos of people in her organization. Maybe that once in a while we have a photo of her at a podium or giving a presentation or leading a conference. But we don't focus too much on that. We really focus on the content. We always have a call to action at the end of each post, which is a question. It's a thought prompt for your readers. And that's how we get feedback and engagement. So when you say call to action, can you give us some examples of what that might look like on LinkedIn? Sure, absolutely. Richard, if you were posting about a particular IP issue that came out. Bumpers statue, on cars, right? right that's yeah. right. <laughs> You would have your post, right? You'd write out your post. And I, I like to use bullet points in mine. And even selective use of emojis kind of break up the space and make it a little fun to guide the reader. But at the end of the post, ask a question. Would you use external airbag-like bumpers on your car? Or maybe even something more general. What's the best car accessory you've ever invested in? And you'd be surprised. It jump starts a conversation, and it gets people thinking how they can engage with you and participate. That's great. We'll be back right after this. We're speaking with Julie Livingston. She's a public relations expert and a LinkedIn marketing expert. And you're listening to Passage to Profit with Richard Elizabeth Gerhardt. I represent low-cost airlines, and we know a lot of you are not traveling right now, and we understand. However, if you do need to travel between now and the end of the year, now is a great time to lock in some of the lowest prices we've seen in a lifetime. Hey, in normal times, we can save you up to 75%, but now airlines are practicing practically giving away seats. We have inside deals on over 500 airlines. Here are a few sample round trip deals we found. Seattle to Vegas, $35. Chicago to Atlanta, $85. Los Angeles to Atlanta, 100 bucks. Of course, there are some limitations, but the airlines want your business right now. And cancellation and change fees are flexible. So, fly somewhere this year, book now, save a ton, call right now. 858 988 
That's 858-988-7477. Have you ever met a single person in your life that enjoys paying taxes? No, no one does. If you can't sleep at night because you have a huge problem with the IRS, I've got some free advice for you. This service is strictly limited to individuals that owe the IRS $10,000 or more in back taxes. And if you qualify, we can guarantee that you won't be writing a big fat check to the IRS or our services cost you nothing. The first 100 people that call today will get a free tax consultation worth $500. Stop worrying about your IRS problem. We can help you. We promise. Call the tax doctor right now. I mean right now to learn more. 800-917-8546. 800-917-8546. 800-917-8546. That's 800-917-8546. Now back to Passage to Profit. Once again, Richard and Elizabeth Gearhart. And our special guest, Julie Livingston, who has been talking about the importance of LinkedIn for business owners and entrepreneurs. Julie, how important are images and videos and where and when should you use them on your LinkedIn posts? I love images and videos. They bring a post, they bring the content alive, and they help to separate you from the pack. So for my clients, we try to get snapshots of them in the field doing things because people love seeing photos of the person they're reading it from. But if that's not available, I use license-free photos. That's an IP issue. You would definitely. So I don't want to be borrowing anybody's photos without their permission. I get photos from sites like Pixabay or Unsplash or Flickr. I'm sure I know there are many others that you can use. And you need to be careful of that. You don't want to use photos that are not license free. And then we get to play on Canva so that even if you use stock photos, you can make them look less generic by importing them to Canva and creating your own little layout. Actually, just today, I was uh, writing a post for a client about interpersonal communication, and I used a photo of two seahorses. Now, I I had to create this, and they were in color. I found them on a you know, license-free photos. We imported them into Canva, and we had it so they're facing each other, so it looks like they're talking. So it illustrates the point of the post. LinkedIn also loves photos and loves video, and they encourage people to use the LinkedIn Live platform, which you can only use if you've turned on creator mode. But you could also import video onto the platform. And again, I think it brings out one's personality, one's speaking style, even your warm factor, you know, how warm of a person you are. Because Even though LinkedIn is a business platform, people go on LinkedIn to connect with other humans. They want to connect with other people. And if they see you in action, they hear your voice, they see, you know, your eye contact, they're going to want to do business with you. Absolutely. Kenya. So you said something very interesting about them adding a creator feature. Do you think it's because they're trying to follow the Instagram model in a way, just because I feel like sometimes there's a generational disconnect from LinkedIn versus Instagram. Like I'm big on, I like Instagram, right? I gravitate towards it maybe because I'm more of a visual person and I do have a creator and a business page. And I feel like I try to use it to be a thought leader and an expert in that space. But in the same essence, I don't necessarily gravitate towards LinkedIn And I'm wondering if it's generational. I don't think it's generational at all. In fact, so LinkedIn has something called creator mode. It's free. So you have to just click the toggle button to turn it on. And it gives you these additional graphic features. I only recommend using creator mode if you have more than 500 connections on LinkedIn. Because the only downside of turning on creator mode is that your connect button is not visible. So you have to go through one more step. So it's better if you're a more connected kind of individual to use creator mode. However, it's really fantastic. It gives you the opportunity to add a custom URL in your header. So again, the top third of your header, people just, you can send them to your website, your Substack, whatever it is, your Instagram page. So I think that's a great marketing tool. You can use LinkedIn Live, which is their live video platform, which is similar to Facebook Live. 
And now you could do LinkedIn audio. I've been listening to so many of these audio podcasts on LinkedIn, and they're more casual, kind of you could do them on the fly because there is no visual kind of component to it. And I love the featured section. The featured section is like a theatrical marquee, and it's like a slideshow on the second third of your LinkedIn profile. I like to keep that fresh. So I'm always asking my clients every week, what do you have that's visual that we could add to the featured section? Kind of like your, your body bit. of work, right? That's right. Yeah. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Or to show photos of you at a conference or at a trade show. Featured section is fantastic. So, Julie, all of this takes a lot of time, and I should go on LinkedIn more. I kind of neglected my LinkedIn the last couple of years. I'm feeling like I should get back on there. So I have a bunch of people that wanted to connect with me, and I didn't, and they're probably waiting there. So I'm feeling like I should go connect with them, But and then people want me to follow them all the time. How do you know who to connect with and who to follow? Do you just accept everything because you assume everyone's a business person, or are there people on there that maybe you shouldn't? Well, you know, Elizabeth, everybody has a different philosophy about making new connections. But here's what I do and and what I help my clients do. I like to vet invitations. I look at the person's profile first and see if they are a good connection for me. If we have mutual connections, you know, that means that we're a second degree connection. That shows that they are credible to me. So I will often accept them. I get a lot of invitations from third-degree connections. Honestly, I usually don't accept them. But I always look at the profile first because you never know. And I have met clients and client prospects that way, people who were not second-degree connections. But I always start with the second-degree ones. How much time should I spend working on LinkedIn if I want to make it a useful business tool for myself? Well, I think that you're an entrepreneur or you're involved in any kind of business You're busy. You've got a lot of things that you're juggling. But I would say have a plan to get started that's not so overwhelming. So I would say about 15 minutes a day to start. And start by updating your profile, optimizing it so that it really shines and really tells your story in an instant, like in a nanosecond. People understand what you do and who you're about. And then Start commenting on other people's posts. That's easy. And it only takes maybe a minute or two to write. But write a good comment. Write a substantive comment. Not like, oh, great post. Fabulous. I love it. No. Really add some substance to it. So, again, it shows who you are as a thought leader. And then participate in those collaborative articles. Those also are very quick. They're not time-consuming. All of these things together will start building your visibility. And then over time, maybe start posting once a week. I know that a lot of journalists are now surfing on LinkedIn. It used to be on Twitter, more so now on LinkedIn, because they can learn more about the the subject matter expert by going to their profile. So a lot of my clients have gotten podcast interviews, uh, major media interviews, because of the way their LinkedIn profile comes across. Now, here's another really in the weeds question for you. Should you post your post in your general LinkedIn profile and then go into LinkedIn groups and post it again in groups? Or should you post different stuff in groups? I was just talking about this the other day, Elizabeth. So LinkedIn groups are, eh, I would forget about them. They're just not, for the most part, they're not active. I would forget about them if you don't have a lot of time to spend on LinkedIn. If you have a little bit more time, explore the groups and see which ones have a lot of engagement and a lot of vibrant discussions in them. Most of them don't, unfortunately. But post on your personal page. You should always have a company page as well. But most people, as I said, want to connect with other humans on LinkedIn and they'll follow a company page, but they may not be as actively engaged on that page. One of the things that I always do whenever we have a new client or maybe a potential new employee or I meet somebody, I almost always go to LinkedIn to check to them check out. check them out, yeah. Right, and find out what's going on because I mean, they may not have a Facebook, they may not have Instagram, but if they're professional, they're going to have a you LinkedIn profile. You know they're going to have a LinkedIn profile. And so even if you just have no interest in becoming a thought leader or generating content, I mean, you should, but just if, even if you, you have to have an acceptable LinkedIn profile to give some information about what's going on because people are looking at it. They are looking at it. And, you know, let's say I met you at a cocktail party and I wanted to continue getting to know you, Richard. I would start commenting on your posts 
And hopefully you're going to notice that over time. And you'd be surprised at how relationships get started that way, business relationships and, you know, strategic partnerships and, you know, interest from journalists. It's, it's just an amazing tool. If our listeners are not in a position where they can hire an expert like you, where can they learn more about LinkedIn, just how it operates, and maybe some good strategies? LinkedIn actually has LinkedIn Learning, and they have a series of videos and I think like downloadable tip sheets that you could look at um, to get info. And of course, you could search on YouTube. There are a lot of great tutorials about building your content. But I find that one of the best ways to learn more about the platform is by following other leaders who you admire. And if they have a good following, if they have a robust following, they're doing something right. And what is your website? My website is wantleverage.com. And I assume you're on LinkedIn. I I was just going to ask that question. (laughs) You definitely find me there. My favorite place to be. Anyway, it's been fantastic speaking with you, Julie. And we're really happy that you could join us today and give us the lowdown on LinkedIn. And you're listening to Passage to Profit with Richard and Elizabeth Gerhardt. We'll be back for more right after this commercial message. Do you own an annuity, either fixed rate, indexed, or variable? Are you paying high fees and getting low returns? If so, Annuity General would like you to have this free book to learn the pitfalls and mistakes of buying an annuity. The Annuity Do's and Don'ts for Baby Boomers contains the little-known truths about annuities, like how to help reduce your fees and increase retirement income. And it's free. That's right, free. As a bonus, we'll also throw in a free annuity rate report just for calling. We researched over 1,000 annuities and summarized rates and benefits from financially strong insurers. You get annuity do's and don'ts for baby boomers and the annuity rate report, both absolutely free for calling Annuity General today. Hurry, supplies are limited. Call now. 800-653-8302. 800-653-8302. 800-653-8302. That's 800-653-8302. The old way of living with diabetes is a pain. You've got to remember to do your testing and always need to stick your fingers to test your blood sugar. The new way to live your life with diabetes is with a continuous glucose monitor. Apply a discrete sensor on your body and it continuously monitors your glucose levels, helping you spend more time in range and freeing you from painful finger sticks. If you are living with type 1 or type 2 diabetes and you use insulin or have had hypoglycemic events, you might be eligible for a CGM through your insurance benefits. U.S. Med partners with over 500 private insurance companies and Medicare. We offer free shipping, 90-day supplies, and we bill your insurance. Call us today for a free benefits check. 800-824-4596. 800-824-4596. 800-824-4596. That's 800-824-4596. Passage to Profit continues with Richard and Elizabeth Gearhart. And we just had a fascinating discussion with Julie Livingston, who is a public relations expert and also a LinkedIn guru. If you haven't had a chance to hear the whole interview, you can catch it on our podcast, which will be available tomorrow anywhere you get your podcasts and it's uh, highly recommended and we hope that you link a lot of people in with it and now it is time for power move kenya gibson what is power move this week power move this week we are going to be featuring nfl free safety anthony harris jr he recently was featured in forbes and beyond football he is an entrepreneur a philanthropist and a new father And he recently was on my Power Move podcast talking about his foundation, fatherhood, and the launch of his apparel brand. He loves being a new dad, and his foundation is all about supporting the youth with guidance, mentorship, food security, which is super important, and the distribution of resources. Anthony is challenging and changing the narrative when it comes to athletes' roles in society, and you can hear about his story and everything that he's doing in the community on my Power Move podcast. That sounds great. Where can people hear your Power Move podcast? Well, you can watch it on YouTube. It's available there and anywhere pretty much you can listen to your podcast. I love that idea because athletes have so much influence in our culture and a lot of them are trying to do the right thing, but 
I think there's possibilities where mm -hmm. they could do more, right? Totally. And he's leading the effort for that, and I think that's amazing. And so. I think sometimes, too, with people only think you just play football. Right. And you don't. You right. do so many other things. So I love that he's setting an example of that. That's great. And now it's time for my charming wife, Elizabeth, to tell us all about her projects. Yes, and sometimes people think all I ever do is talk. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you're, Especially my family. You're, you're good at it. <laughs> so I have a video directory of business professionals, B2B, called Blue Streak. I'm hoping to get the website done by the end of the year. I really am. And then, you know, I really do have to work on my LinkedIn profile and my LinkedIn connections because that's where I'm going to be getting people for my website. That's Honestly. the timing is perfect. <laughs> right. I may have to be reaching out to Julie. Help. But uh, <laughs> it is a B2B website directory it's a video directory it's a little bit different than anything that's been done before and i've been working on it for a long time kind of got hung up on the website a little bit but i'm just going to push through and do what i can with it and to hopefully get it done soon and then i have my other podcast which is the jersey podcasts podcast with my co-host danielle woolley where we have people come on and talk about their cats and we talk about our cats and cat health issues and Weird cat behavior. It's, it's really <laughs> what Kenya's weird laughing. cat behavior? What could that guy? be about? <laughs> and uh, and we're having a lot of fun with that. And then I have another podcast. I'm kind of reframing it. I didn't realize this, but there is a thing called a faceless YouTube channel where you can own a channel and pay other people to do all the work, but then you put the channel together and you don't have to be on YouTube yourself if you don't want to be. <laughs> Anyways, it's very cool. I'm looking at some aspects of that for my other podcast. So I'm going to be taking some time to kind of regroup and do a little bit more research. So that's where I'm at. There's just so much going on in the social media world. Now you can have a YouTube channel without doing anything yeah i mean that's you just that's have to a, manage it you know that's yeah. amazing you that's pay everybody amazing. on five or an upwork to do it <laughs> but enough about me now this next person that is coming on talk about the podcasting queen wow and she's also a photographer so if you do need your linkedin headshot uh she is the person to go to so Lee Wahara, who is a photographer, a serial entrepreneur, serial podcaster. She is a great catch for the show. Thank you so much for having me. I am a photographer who captures moments, people, and action. I'm here today to tell everyone that a photo, uh, whether it's a profile photo or a photo of you in action, I think Julie mentioned that earlier, is so important. And if you cannot afford a photographer at the moment, you can clean off your phone's camera lens and take your own shots and then have them edited. You can even do that thing where, you know, you press down on your phone and it lifts your photo out of the background and you can place it in front of something else. But it's very important to have an updated photo. So and I'm going to go there, people. If you've gained 15, 20 pounds, you need to update that photo because oh my God. you know oh. what? First of all, self-acceptance when you're an entrepreneur <laughs> is so important. And then it doesn't matter because you know you'll get back to down to the size you want when you're ready. But the thing is, when you have a photo of yourself that's supposed to be representative of you and your brand and your company, and it's from 10 years old, it's from 20 pounds ago, it's like a bait and switch. When people get to you, there's no authenticity. And so the whole thing is to have people know, like, and trust you. Right. And so you've just got to be real. And there are ways to take photos to be more flattering. But ultimately, I'm here to say, please put yourself forth in a current photo. You've got to go with the flow with who you are. And so having a current accurate photo or you in action can also be flattering. Right. Well, I think my hair <laughs> went from brown to gray over the summertime. I went to have my passport renewed and my assistant put in the hair color and she put gray. And I'm like, no, that's wrong. I have brown hair. And the guy at the post office just started laughing. And he, he was great, too. So anyway, I guess I always just use the excuse. I haven't gotten around to updating it. And 
you know, that college picture, maybe it's not right for LinkedIn. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> not if college was more than five years ago. <laughs> I, well, maybe 10, in my case. <laughs> so, so do you have a studio in New York here? Yes, the city landscape is my studio. I prefer to stay outside of indoors. I can totally do the studio set up. I prefer to catch people in moments in action. I prefer that we do environmental portraits, catching you in your element. Because when folks are captured doing what they love to do, the demeanor on film in the digital shot is so much more powerful. Everybody needs a headshot and needs an action shot. I agree with you. But what I really want to find out is you are actually making money doing podcasts. How are you doing that? I like in having a podcast as having a ticket to the show. It's a ticket into the door. It's a doorway that you get to go through. It's a ticket to opportunity. And so I I have one show where I have a local diner paying advertising occasionally. Having a podcast opens the door to so many opportunities that you wouldn't even imagine. And only, only if you say yes. Podcasting allows one to monetize, and there's more than one way to monetize. And it also allows for exciting opportunities. So you have New York City podcasters, and that's a monetization vehicle for you. Is that correct? NYC Podcasters is an indie collective of shows here in town. And the showrunners and I get together. It's a way to connect and build community. And yes, there is a membership fee, but the money generally uh, goes back into the programming, so to say. So you said you have two podcasts? Well, I have a couple more, uh -huh. but uh, I'm, and I'm always, the struggle is always to keep them updated. I was going to say, a podcast are a lot of work. You know what I figured out is one of them, I do while I'm walking my dog, literally. It's called Upper West Side Corner Talk. And it's uh, news that you'd get from a friend or a neighbor at the corner while walking your dog. And I literally do it when I'm walking my dog. Uh, and I, I believe that if you want to share whatever your message is or however you want to do it, Always make it fit your flow and where you're at in life. And the other thing, too, is carrying some portable gear that way. So, for example, like, let's say this show's over and, uh, and I can ask all of you, hey, do you want to be on my show? I can interview you in the hallway with my cell phone for like three minutes and boom, that's an episode. So if somebody wants to start a podcast, where do they start? They start with figuring out what their message is. It's as simple as what does one love to talk about? But if you have a business that you want to highlight and to have folks get to know, like, and trust you right away, that's another way to do it. So really all you need is your voice, a recording mechanism, and an upload button with a podcast host. I do recommend... Uh, I'm, I'm an audio snob, actually, and so a microphone like this is great. Uh, having a good microphone, a dynamic cardioid microphone, is the best way to go. And you don't have to spend a lot of money to start properly right out of the gate. So do you recommend getting on to some of the podcast platforms like Castos or Apple Podcasts, or do you recommend just putting it out on LinkedIn or Facebook? How do you go about distributing the podcast once you've started it? The main debate is what is a podcast? And for us diehards, a podcast is truly a podcast when you have an RSS feed and it is distributed through Apple Podcasts. So what is an RSS feed? Basically, it's your unique identifier for your show that carries the information. It's like a bus that carries your, your episodes that Apple Podcasts always uh, looks for new episodes and then distributes those automatically. Kenya. Now YouTube has... A podcast platform. So if and actually Elizabeth is the one that introduced me to this. So if YouTube actually has a podcast platform for your audio and your visuals. So they're doing that. LinkedIn, you had mentioned earlier that LinkedIn has an audio component for podcasts, right? You can just do it on your phone. You can yeah. use LinkedIn audio. Now you do have to switch on creator mode to use that feature, mm -hmm. but it's a great way to get started in podcasting. Yeah. And and just do the audio, do it on your phone, make sure you're in a quiet place. I'm in the process of trying to start a 
another podcast myself, there's a lot to it. There's all of these different companies that have all this different kind of software. It's taken a lot of time just to kind of work through getting it out there. Well, you right? guys were ahead of the curve with Passage to Profit. Well, this was one of this that's was because it was your idea, Kenya. Well, I mean, we initially we weren't thinking about <laughs> doing a podcast, and the podcast kind of, we treated it kind of second nature. But like we're really way ahead of the game in terms of the broadcast to podcast strategy. So that was smart. Yes, I think getting your message out in any form via MP3 and uploading it anywhere is great. The reason you want to go through Apple Podcasts for your distribution is because when you go to a podcast hosting platform specifically, for example, Libsyn, uh, Podbean, Blueberry, they will then take your episodes and they'll upload them. And then when you have your Apple Podcast feed, anyone can listen to your show anywhere through any listening app. And what you want is wide distribution. So for example, there are some shows that only list on Spotify. But what happens if you don't have a Spotify account? I don't listen to Spotify. That's not where I get my audio and my music. And so the idea and the goal really is to spread your message as far and wide as possible. So If you are uploading only to YouTube's podcast platform because they don't distribute through Apple, which Apple goes everywhere. So if you're going to do YouTube and LinkedIn, take that same MP3 file and upload it through a podcast hosting app and then everyone can listen. Another thing to do is to have events and be associated with this. So like you hosted an event in New York. For PodFest, called Pod Tour, New York City, right? PodFest is the largest independent podcasters conference in Orlando in January. And I am also an event organizer. And in collaboration with NYC Podcasters, we had this meetup. Meeting people in a grassroots one-on-one way is one of the number one methods to gaining more listeners, but also connecting and building community, right? Like, so we all, everyone in here now knows each other and we can now reach out to each other. And most of us have podcasts or thinking about them. What's the best way for people to find you? You can visit me at waharaphotography.com. I'm sure it'll be in the show notes. And for anyone who visits and reaches out, I have a special photo checklist that people can have. It's Lee, and can I spell your last name? It's U-E-H-A-R-A, photography.com. And she's here in New York City and just a lovely person, so reach out. Now, we actually have two guests who formed a company together, a mother-daughter company, which I think is so very cool. Barbara and Danielle Gomes. I don't know. Can we imagine our daughter working with us on a company? She barely eats dinner with us. <laughs> <laughs> so Barbara and Danielle Gomes, if you have fingernails, you need this product. So please tell us about your product. Okay. Well, thank you so much. It's exciting to be back. I thought of my product like 40 years ago, or I saw a need for my product. My mother, at a very young age, had a very aggressive breast cancer, and she's a cancer survivor. She lived to be 93, but the mastectomy and all of her surgeries left her with a very lymphedema arm and a very compromised immune system. So her arm could not get a pinprick, a bug bite, a scratch, or she would be on antibiotics, intravenous antibiotics for six weeks. So we had a problem with her nails, and the only way we could take care of her nails were to file them. And because the arm had very dry skin, she would get lots of hangnails, but we would just file them off. And the file worked great, but it was a horrible, they weren't round, they didn't fit around the cuticles. So back then I would say, I'm going to invent something. And all these years we looked and looked for something. So finally I had my children, and they would come with the hangnails, and we'd file them. Then I had my grandchildren, and I told, actually, I have two daughters that we are in business with. Danielle is here with me. We decided to make this and to patent it, and it is to uh, the right curve. So when you go to file your cuticle or your hangnail, you don't cut into the nail. It's wonderful for children. And also, I was having friends come to me who would have breast cancer And their doctors would say, 
do not go to get a manicurist because they'll cut your cuticles. So they said, what do we do? I'd say, well, come over. I'll file them down for you. So that's how Cuticle Be Gone has been invented. And our hope is to get everybody to stop cutting those hangnails and cuticle nails and to use Cuticle Be Gone. But the one thing that you also should know is that a lot of states, New York being one, make it illegal for your cuticles to be cut in beauty salons. So that just shows you another thing, how dangerous it is and how great the infection rate is. Lee, okay, so I don't have a cuticle be gone, but I have a cuticle pusher. And you know where I keep it? I keep it in the shower so I can do it every day. Now, my question for you is cuticle be gone waterproof? Can I buy one and keep it on my little rack in the in the shower? Cuticle be gone is completely waterproof. It can be sterilized when it's in salons. It can be sterilized. What I do is I keep mine by my bedside. And then I just wash it off, and I take mine to my manicurist because even though they're not supposed to do it, they pull out those scissors and they want to cut. And uh, also, it was created. We came up with our prototype, but I had it made by a company that makes medical tools. Kenya had a comment or a question Well, I did. I had for Richard and for you. So you did the patent? We did, yes. As a matter of fact, it's been issued, and we have international patents. We have trademarks and um yeah it's a it's an amazing tool and it's and it's inventive which Mm -hmm. is how we were able to get patents on it yeah and just going back to your story i love when products are invented from like personal stories or struggles right like so you took something that was an unfortunate situation and you created a solution for people which i think is remarkable so in terms of like other products you may expand into, like in the beauty market, have you thought about that a little bit? Yes, we have. And I do want to just say the Cuticle Be Gone has four different tips. You just screw them on two sides so it really fits into any corner on the nail. But yes, we do have a nail polish. Sage oil is a very good oil for your nail. So we're trying to come up with a good organic sage oil and maybe coconut or almond oil. We're developing a line of dry oils, all natural, all organic, that are going to come out soon that will add to our product line. Julie Livingston. How are you telling your story? We do have Facebook. We have Instagram and TikTok, but I've learned a lot today. You're looking to attract retailers, distributors, I'm imagining. Those people are on LinkedIn. I think I think you should start by telling your personal story about how you developed this product. I agree. It's powerful. Thank you. It really Thank is. You. Even creating maybe a little video using, if you don't have video of your mother, but maybe some still shots that you could animate and string together to show people what her needs were. Oh, that's a great idea. I mean, you want to reach hospitals, hospital gift stores, I would imagine, yes, right? Yes. Cancer is, centers. Yes, yes. Yeah. especially people with breast cancer. I have three friends who have had breast cancer, and you know they are not allowed to bring scissors near their fingernails Yeah, you've got a lot of great content, I think, and, and get, you got to get it out there. And, you know, small little bite-sized pieces, but um, I think you have such a wonderful story to tell. I love the idea of bringing the whole mom in hospital setting, and that video that you have on your website of how to use it is really great. So my other question is, how do you sell it into retail stores? Do you have a display? It seems that it would need some kind of a graphic or some signage to explain what the product is, how it's different from you know, some of the other Sally Hansen or Revlon kind of tools that are already out there. Well, we do have in our packaging how to use it. And there is a QR code where you can go in and it will explain. But a retailer, retailers will probably want you to have some kind of signage, maybe even a holder, you know, whether it's a plexi holder or a box that you can house the product in so that it can stand out in their store. Also, our tagline is stop cutting your cuticles for a more beautiful nail. We have lots of signage. We're doing trade shows. We have displays 
a really well-developed website and Shopify account and social media. That's great. But now we are starting LinkedIn yes. for a CEO. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe you should start a podcast. Maybe you could. The Cuticle could, Podcast. The Cuticle I, Podcast. I, I think so. I have Danielle. to put my publicist hat on again. I think that you also ought to pitch this product to some of the um, beauty and fashion lifestyle magazines because they all do beauty product roundups. Mm -hmm. And I think this, it has such a great story. And I just want to add how inspired we are by my mom, who she had a very successful career as a ballerina and dancer before she retired to raise her family, then decided to start her own company. And both my other sister, myself, and my brother, who's a little bit involved with this, we all also have our own businesses. So to see my mom come and start doing something like this is just it's incredible. Wow. It's wonderful. So your plans for the future? Most important to our company is to create a product that's sustainable and healthy for both people that use it and won't impact the environment in a negative way. So every product that we design is meant to be reusable. Our nail dry oil that's coming out will be in glass bottles. It's all organic, all natural. So it might take us a little longer to add products to our line, but we're staying true to our core values when we do. Excellent. So how can people buy your product? We are on Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok. And we go under cuticle, the word cuticle, just the letter B, and the last word, be gone. Okay, cuticle, be gone. Yeah, hopefully we're adding more. Any Excellent. chances you'll get on Amazon? That's what we're working on. So we're talking to a few retailers because it is a little bit complicated to start your own store. So we're learning the hoops that we have to jump through to get on. Passage to Profit, Road to Entrepreneurship with the Richard and Elizabeth Gearhart, our special guest, Julie Livingston. And we will be right back. Have you heard about PodFest yet? It's the world's largest continuous in-person podcasting event in Orlando, Florida. And you got to check it out. Richard Gearhart here. And I want to tell you about an event that we're going to that we're super excited about. Yes, PodFest Expo 2024 is coming soon. A huge podcasting festival in Florida. And it's their 10th anniversary. Go to PodFestExpo.com and use the code GearhartLaw for your ticket. Whether you have a podcast and want to meet other podcasters, you're thinking of starting a podcast yourself, or you provide support to podcasts, this is the place to be in 2024. Meet the people who are shaping and influencing the podcasting industry and join PodFest as they also host the Podcasting Hall of Fame. The dates are January 25th through the 28th, 2024, and we'd love for you to join us in meeting podcasters from around the globe. The diverse cast of speakers means there's something for everyone. The learning and networking will be amazing. Throw in a couple of parties just for fun, and you have the podcasting event of the year. Go to PodFestExpo.com to get your ticket now. Use the code GearHeartLaw for a special discount. Elizabeth and I hope to meet you there. It's Passage to Profit. Now it's time for Noah's Retrospective. Noah Fleischman is our producer here at Passage to Profit, and he just has a way of putting his best memories in perspective. Isn't it phenomenal the way that text messaging has taken over the act of conversation with so many people? You ever see a couple in a restaurant just sitting there saying nothing to one another all night, but they're just looking down into their smartphones communicating by text? It's unbelievable. And the biggest question to our sociology today is, where was this technology in 1985 when we needed it the most, particularly my aunt? She, my mother, and teenage me went out one evening in 1985 to our favorite diner. Quiet night. Nobody in the place but us. It was very serene. All of a sudden, a lone stranger comes in, seats himself at a table yards away. My aunt and my mother are having their typical top-of-their-lungs dinner conversation, and all of a sudden my aunt leans over to my mom and says, Do you see the shirt that man is wearing? Why is he wearing a shirt like that? It's terrible. It makes him look strange. He shouldn't be wearing that shirt. My mother doesn't know what to say, and I'm sitting there just beside myself. Finally, I lean over to my aunt and say, Will you knock it off? He can hear every word you're saying. My aunt looks at me with that explosive look, and you know what's coming. She leans back and yells at the top of her lungs, He can't hear what I'm saying. The next sound you heard was the lone stranger getting up and leaving the dining room. I would like to think that text messaging could have helped us avoid some humiliation that night, but chances are it wouldn't have. My aunt and all of her good fortune would have had voice to text on her phone, causing her to simply look down into her smartphone and yell at the top of her lungs, 
Do you believe the shirt he's wearing? How could he wear a shirt like that? Now more with Richard and Elizabeth. Passage to Profit. What an amazing show we've had. I have learned so much. There's I, always something you don't know. Right. That somebody else knows. <laughs> so somebody else knows. And speak, no matter how much you think you know. And speaking of that, why don't we get to your question? Okay, so I am going to start with... Our guest today, Julie Livingston. I think I know the answer, but what would you like to be known as an expert in? I'm a LinkedIn expert, and I help raise executive visibility. I help companies and executives be seen and heard. Excellent. Okay, Kenya Gibson. You're I knew next. you were going to make me follow her. That was like so good. I don't know if I can. <laughs> you're, you're an expert at I was reading say, like, Elizabeth's mind. Or something. <laughs> I know what you're. Next. I think you're a creative expert, but you tell me what oh, you want to be. I will go with that. I'll take. I'll go with creative expert, and I would say personal branding. Um, I think. I've learned a lot from revamping my own personal brand and content, and I think I can help people do that and share their story in a very authentic way and tap into their authenticity. So I love your Instagram account. I think, you know, she has one of the most creative Instagrams ever. Thank you. And, and that's because I have creative people around me like Dre, who's here with us today. But <laughs> you should definitely go and check Coach Kenya out on her Instagram page because Thank you. it I appreciate is that. a lot of really cool stuff. Thank so, you. Absolutely. I have, a, I have a good team of people who help. And Lee Wahara, uh, what do you want to be known as an expert in? I know it's probably more than one thing. I'm known for helping to uplift others via multimedia content creation and consulting via photography, podcasting, and journalism. Wow. That was really good. Barbara Gomes, what do you want to be known as an expert in? Well, I think I'm creative, and I think I would like to be known that whatever I do, I put passion behind it. And Danielle Gomes? I think I would like to be known for being an expert in fiction writing. Well, I do content creation. I do branding. My passion is really fiction. Excellent. What kind of fiction? I have a few books out. They're thrillers. I'm also writing horror, so... A little bit of everything. Sounds like my cup of tea. Richard Gerhardt, what do you want to be known as I would as like an to be known as an expert pontificator. I want to be known as somebody who can pontificate about anything, even if he knows nothing about it. But I'm also a real expert on intellectual property, and you I've are. been doing it for a long time, and uh, I enjoy it. And so I do like that, too. And for me, I mean, I thought about this a lot, and I've really dug into video these last few years, and I really think I'm going to try to become an expert in YouTube podcasting because I think that I'm afraid that YouTube is going to do the same thing to poor little Apple that Microsoft did years ago and just kind of say, okay, you defined and developed the market. You've got all the consumers. Now we're going to swoop in and just take over. So <laughs> that's kind of what I'm working on right now. And you have done some amazing podcasting. Your Fiona podcast is a model of really fantastic content and creativity. I would like to recap all the wonderful people that we had on our show and where you can find them. Julie Livingston, who is a public relations and LinkedIn marketing expert, and her website is wantleverage.com. And, of course, you can find her on LinkedIn. Lots of great tips there and a lot of great experience. Absolutely. And then Lee Wahara, who is a photographer and really a fun photographer. I mean, the city landscape is her backdrop. That is just so cool. And she is at waharaphotography.com, U-E-H-A-R-A photography.com. And she has a lot of other stuff going on. She's just a fascinating person. So reach out to her. I really liked her approach of taking photographs of people when they're in action. I think that's yeah. a really great approach. Yeah, and she and Julie can work together to get those on their LinkedIn profiles. <laughs> Love then, it. Love that. Yeah. And then Barbara and Danielle Gomes with Cuticle Be Gone. What a story. And you can find them at Cuticle, C-U-T-I-C-L-E, B. G-O-N-E dot com. So cuticle, the letter B, gone dot com. And really, what a great gift for the holidays. It slips into a stocking or into a little tiny package. I was just going to say it's a perfect stocking stuffer. So get your cuticle be gone for sure. And if you want to learn more about trademarks, you can go to learn more about trademarks dot com. Or if you want to learn more about patents, you can go to learn more about patents.com. Or you too. can just call Richard, 908-273-0700. If you have a question and you want a free consultation, 
anything intellectual property related? I mean, he might consult on other things too, but <laughs> his expertise is you intellectual need some property. some pontificating, <laughs> just give me a call. Anyway, it's time to wind things down here, unfortunately. And I want to say thank you to the Passage to Profit team, Noah Fleischman, our producer, Alicia Morrissey, our program director. Our podcast can be found tomorrow anywhere you find your podcast. Just look for the Passage to Profit show. And you can find us on Instagram and threads at Passage to Profit show and Twitter or or if you're even more up to date, X at Passage to Profit and on our YouTube channel. Please also join us on our new Facebook group. Search for Passage to Profit Show Listener Community, a new community space for our listeners and guests where you can post questions that you would like answered on the show and interact with the Passage to Profit team. And remember, while the information on this program is believed to be correct, never take a legal step without checking with your legal professional first. Gerhardt Law is here for your patent and trademark and copyright needs. You can find us at gearheartlaw.com and contact us for a free consultation. Take care, everybody. Thanks for listening, and we'll be back next week.